Let's just quickly pray. Today we're doing part two of our baptism of the Holy Spirit it's teaching, which I think is appropriate because we're talking about the application and what this means for us today. And it's blowing the gale outside, so it's good. <laughs> As it is in the natural, and then it is in the spirit. <laughs> we we'll just pray first. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth and it's life. Father, we just pray that as we uh, go through your word today that you give us understanding, open our eyes, open our ears. May we be like the like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus and you open their eyes and their understanding to the scriptures. Father, may we be the same. Help us. Help us to understand your word, especially this topic on the Holy Spirit. We thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So in part one of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we went through some Greek, uh, Hebrew and Greek words to get a better understanding of the Holy Spirit, especially what these mean, words mean from a Hebraic perspective. It is so important to understand the terminology of the original language, in my opinion that our English translations are translated from these Hebrew and Greek languages. As we know, the English meanings can be quite different to what the original Hebrew meanings are. So I encourage everyone, if you haven't seen part one, to go and have a look at it, and it will help you in this understanding of what we're talking about today. So in part one, I ask the question, does the Holy Spirit play a role in a believer's life? And I would definitely say absolutely yes, it does play a role in a believer's life today. In this teaching, I will be teaching on the application of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life and how does one receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? But first of all, let's go through some Old Testament examples and see people being filled or influenced by the Holy Spirit. Because like we shared in part one, a lot of people doesn't, don't think that the Holy Spirit was active or filled people or touched people in the Old Testament, all because of the words. So we're going to go through some examples now in the Old Testament. The Exodus. 31, 2 to 3. And it says, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. So here we see here quite clearly what's the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. So we see quite clearly that uh, this person was filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and we know that this person over, oversaw all the workmanship of the uh, furnishings and the utensils and the making of the tabernacle way back in Exodus. Here's another example in Numbers eleven sixteen to 17. So Yahweh said to Moshe, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you not bear, that you may not bear it yourself alone. So here we're talking about Moshe's. What was the spirit in Moshe? 
It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Yahweh is not going to take the spirit of Moshe himself and put it on the other 70. That is idolatry. He's going to take on the spirit that was from Yahweh, that was put onto Moshe. So it was the Holy Spirit that was in Moshe that he was going to put on the other 70. It wasn't the spirit of Moshe as a person. It was the Holy Spirit. Another example, 11, a little bit later in that cha- same chapter, Numbers 11, 25 to 26, Then Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same spirit on the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the other, the name of the other was Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. So here we see a manifestation of when the Holy Spirit came upon them. One of those manifestations is prophecy. This is what Paul talks about when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is prophecy. So we see this manifesting thousands of years earlier. But the gifts of the Spirit are New Testament. We'll talk about that another time. Numbers 27, 18. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Take Joshua, or Yahushua, the son of Nun, with you. A man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. So this is the, the, the passage where Moshe actually lays his hands on Joshua and he passed that same Spirit into him. And we know Joshua became the next leader of Israel. So it was this anointing, this appointing, if you like. But it was the Holy Spirit taking, because Moshe, we know, not long after this died. So Joshua was inaugurated, if you like, in front of all the people and became the next leader. Here we go. Deuteronomy 34, 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Now we read earlier that there was another guy that was had the spirit of wisdom placed on him. It's the same spirit. For Moshe had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Remember, these are all examples of the Holy Spirit being put on people in the Old Testament, being immersed, being baptized, if you like, in the Holy Spirit. Here's another example in 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, this happened when David was a young boy. Remember, Samuel went to his father's Jesse and he saw all the sons and he said, do you have any other sons? And he said, well, we have our youngest, which is out in the field. But the spirit of Yahweh, the Holy Spirit, was on David from that day forward before he became king. So from that day forward, the the Holy Spirit was on David. And then we know what happened after this. He killed the bear, he killed the lion, he did all these wonderful things, he took out Goliath because he had the Holy Spirit first. Psalm 51, 11. This is David, one of his psalms. Do not cast me away from your presence and take. do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So obviously he had the Holy Spirit because he's saying, don't take him from me. Don't take the Holy Spirit from me. And there are so many more examples of the Old Testament people being filled. The, the half to our portion this week was uh, in Judges and the guy that was that they asked to become the leader of Gilead, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit as well. So that's just another example that lined up with uh, this week's reading. So there are so many examples in the Old Testament of people being filled, immersed and led by the Spirit of, God, of Yahweh. 
just because it doesn't say Holy Spirit doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit wasn't there. The Spirit of God is exactly the same as saying the Holy Spirit. Like I said in part one, most people think that the Holy Spirit was a very rare occurrence in the Old Testament because when they look up these words, Holy Spirit, that particular phrase is only found three times in the Old Testament. So therefore, the Holy Spirit wasn't really around and they neglect to read the Spirit of God, which is everywhere. So I suggest getting a better look at this in the Old Testament, like I said, to look up the Spirit of God or Spirit of the Lord. And you'll find this everywhere. It's the same Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Like we said last in part part one, the Holy Spirit is a set-apart Spirit, particularly peculiar to Yahweh. The Spirit of God or Spirit of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. As believers, we need the Holy Spirit to help us and empower us to follow Yahweh. Yeshua himself said this, John 14, 26. Yeshua, this is Yeshua speaking. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Notice here he said the Father. People run around asking for Yeshua to send the Holy Spirit. No, he teaches that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. This is what Acts 2 is all about. Yeshua is prophesying. It says here, whom the Father will send in my name. This is what Acts chapter 2 is all about. On the day of Shavuot, or as most people understand, the day of Pentecost, which is a Hebrew feast day, the Father sent and poured out the Holy Spirit. His Spirit upon those disciples of Yeshua who were praying and waiting in one accord. So those disciples of Yeshua, they were at the temple. Why? Because they had to be there. And they were praying and in one accord because Yeshua told them to go there and wait. Let's have a look at this. In Acts 1, chapter 4 and 5, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is Yeshua speaking to his disciples. And being assembled together with them, he commanded not to de- he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Acts 1 8, just a couple of verses later. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when Yeshua said this, he was said this before he ascended to the heavens. And we know that this was on the 40th day of the counting of the Omar. Remember Yeshua died at Passover and then he rose and then we have the counting, we have in that time we have the counting of the Omar of 50 days. This is why the Greeks call that Hebrew festival Pentecost, because Pentecost means 50. They're counting 50 days. So this was on the 40th day of that 50 day count. Ten days later the Holy Spirit, the helper, was sent by the Father on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost which is the 50th day after Passover. Why were they all there? They were there because it was a feast day. They were commanded to be there. We know in the Torah, in the in the first five books, it says three times a year you have to be at the temple. And we know that to be Passover, Shavuot and Tabernacles. They were there because it was the feast of Shavuot, one of the commanded times, one of the appointed times, They had to be there. They had to be there as it was a commandment for them to be there. This Obviously, this commandment wasn't done away with. This is after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Yeshua. 
So obviously it wasn't done away with or finished. They were there. If they believed that they didn't have to do these things anymore, they wouldn't have been there. The Torah was being observed. Why? Because they obviously understood that even though the Messiah had come and gone, they were still following the commandments and the Torah. It was never done away with. Not once did Yeshua ever command or say to them, you don't have to follow my Father's commandments. Not once. He didn't say, you don't have to keep my Father's Sabbath. He never said, you don't have to keep my Father's feast. He never said this because that he died and that it is all finished now. Just because he died, it never mentions, just because he died, we don't have to do these things anymore. He never, 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 never said that. Yes, we need to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 I need, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John speaking. John the Immerser. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now I'm going to teach on this particular verse another time because there's a lot in this verse. Another way of saying the last sentence in this verse from the Greek text is he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit or fire. I'll let that sink in for a moment (laughs) and then think of what fire means in the Revelation. But we'll teach that on another time because we'll get off track. Matthew 3.11 say. John one thirty two, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. So we see this happened at Yeshua's baptism in water. We know Yeshua went to John, the immerser, to get baptized, and then we know that after that happened, the Holy Spirit, he was baptized. In the Holy Spirit, the the Spirit descended upon him like a dove and remained upon him. So Yeshua got double baptized, if you like. Now this particular verse I'm reading out from the um, complete Jewish translation because I think it's a more accurate rendering because it says, the proper words that needs to be said, the festival of Shavuot. Instead of Pentecost, the festival of Shavuot arrived and the believers all gathered together in one place. Why? Because it's commanded, you shall gather together in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar of a violent wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which separated and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the Hebrew way of saying the Holy Spirit, and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So this particular passage, and goes on for the rest of the chapter, most of us are familiar with. This event that happened on the Feast of Shavuot was directly fulfilling a prophecy from Joel chapter 2. And you'll have to read Joel chapter 2 to find that out. But this event is is directly fulfilling what the prophet Joel said centuries earlier. Later on in the same chapter it says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach for the remission of sins and you you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as Yahweh our God will call. So this really blew them away because he's talking about Gentiles here. 
and the, the traditional Jewish people really struggle with this with this idea. So now we're going to move on. How were they baptized in the Holy Spirit? Let us look at some examples. Acts 8, 14 to 17. This is how, just directly from Scripture. We're going through a lot of Scriptures today. Directly from Scripture, we're going to see how they were baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, 14 to 17. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. See, they heard the word of God first, and then they received the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he had not fallen upon none of them. These are the people of Samaria. They had only been baptized in the name of Yeshua. Now, if you want to understand more about that, I encourage you to look at the teaching on water baptism because they were baptized in the name of Yeshua. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit or they were baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 to 18. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, or Shaul, the Lord Yeshua who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me to you that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately then, sorry, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptised. I mean, this is is Paul. Paul, when he was studying and, and, and right up there as far as rabbis go, he wasn't filled with the Spirit. Think about that for a moment. He had this encounter with Yeshua on the road to Damascus, to go and kill Christians. And then Yeshua caused him to be blind, or he saw this bright light, fell off his whatever he was riding, donkey, horse, camel, I don't know. Fell off it, got blinded, went to this town, Ananias was this bloke who Yahweh spoke to by his spirit to go and open his eyes again. And then Paul did some amazing things after being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Same as Yeshua. Yeshua did nothing until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, as far as public ministry goes. But they laid hands. He laid his hands on him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This may be how something like that would happen. Moving on. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, just another way of saying the Jews, those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that they should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Yahweh. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So here we see a bit of a back-to-front thing going on. The Holy Spirit fell on them and then they got baptized in water. Acts 19.6 And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues or different languages and prophesied. A bit like Eldad and Medad and the 70 elders we read back in Numbers. Acts 8.18 And when Simon saw 
that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. So this particular fella, this particular character, he was a sorcerer. And he was well known in the area that he lived for doing supernatural works. And he saw this manifestation of the Holy Spirit that when the apostles laid their hands on different ones, he saw things happening. And he thought, I'll have a bit of that. And he offered them money. And then the apostles rebuked him because his attitude and his heart was wrong. Here's another example. Luke one sixty seven. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Again, we have this filling of the Holy Spirit and prophesying. Who's Zacharias, John's father? Again, this happened before Yeshua was even on the scene. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Luke one thirteen to 15 But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John or Yochanan. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of Yahweh. You shall, he sh- and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So we see John was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born, in his mother's womb. One Corinthians twelve thirteen, for by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. There's only one way this can happen. There's only one Spirit. See, this is said in the context. This is why we need to go in behind the story of the books of the Bible. Corinthians, this is a letter written to Corinthians. Corinthians had a pantheon of gods. They had a pantheon of different spirits. And he's Paul's teaching these Gentiles that were coming from these different pagan religions, there is only one spirit. There is only one spirit that you can be baptized in and one that you can drink from, not this pantheon of many different gods and many different spirits. This is why he's referred, Paul writes a lot about the Holy Spirit because last time when we spoke about this, the Holy Spirit is that set-apart spirit from all other spirits. That's why the New Testament says Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit because it's referring and separating out that spirit from all the other pagan spirits. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Yahweh and you need to drink from that spirit, you need to be baptized into that spirit not from all these other spirits. He's writing to Corinthians, to a pagan people. We see the main way people receive the Holy Spirit or be baptised in the Holy Spirit was the laying on of hands. We even see this way back with Moshe when he laid his hands on Joshua. We see how this took place. But with that being said, There were also other times when the Father just simply poured out his Spirit upon people. He just simply gave the Holy Spirit like on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit just fell upon all those that were in the upper room in one accord praying. When Peter was preaching, the Spirit just fell upon them. He didn't do anything. The Spirit just fell upon them. But then we see other times when the apostles and leaders laid their hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. So I'm trying to bring a balance here. So the Father just simply gave the Holy Spirit to people in the presence of the apostles. We need to be very, very careful about putting how one receives the Holy Spirit into a box, which is what many churches do. You need to do this, you need to do that. There's this particular formula. 
to say that it can only happen that way. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God is manifested in so many different ways. When Yahweh spoke to Moshe from the burning bush, that was the Holy Spirit. You know, the the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, that was the Holy Spirit. When the wind, when Yahweh, when we, when we read in the, uh, when the Exodus and Yahweh blew with an east wind, that was the Holy Spirit. Literally, the Ruach. Because it says Yahweh calls the wind to blow. It's the wind of the Holy Spirit. It's Yahweh. It's, 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 it's the manifestation. It's the active presence of God. If you remember from part one. The Holy Spirit is the active presence of God, the active manifestation of God. So we need to be very careful that it can only happen one way. The Spirit of God manifested so many different ways throughout the book of Acts. Although there are some similarities, all the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are different. If you go through the book of Acts, which is a lot of these references that we've already read out, not once did he fall the same way. Not once did he manifest exactly the same way. So therefore we just can't put God in a box. We can't put the way he chooses to reveal himself in a box. There is also a teaching and a doctrine that is common among churches, especially Pentecostals and Charismatics that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. This is what's taught. This is simply not true. There are some occurrences where some did speak in tongues. We just read some out. But there are also other occurrences where the Bible doesn't say they did after receiving the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't say Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just doesn't say that it did. I'm simply pointing out that, yes, speaking in tongues is a gift and a manifestation from the Holy Spirit, but it is not a requirement for being filled in and immersed in the Holy Spirit. There are only three times in the New Testament where people spoke in tongues. That's written. That's people spoke in tongues. after being baptised or filled with the Holy Spirit. There are many other times people were filled with the Holy Spirit and a text does not make a record that they spoke in tongues. On the issue of tongues, we'll be teaching on that at another time. For example, look, look at John. We just read that John was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Zacharias got touched by the Holy Spirit doesn't say that Yeshua spoke in tongues when the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. But yet there's this doctrine that, that and, they're, and they're, they're adamant about it, that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. It's simply not true. I just wanted to clear this up, that as many people can feel a lot of pressure from Aaron's teachings, that unless you speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And that happens. That unless you speak with the whole, uh, in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. In my opinion, this is just not correct. The church I come out of was like that. They used to try to force people to talk in tongues. Everything we receive from God is by faith. Salvation is by faith. Receiving the gift of the Spirit is by faith. Operating in the gift of the Spirit is by faith. Speaking in tongues is by faith. Prophesying is by faith. Everything is by faith. Laying on of hands is by faith. When we pray for the sick, everything is done by faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our teacher and much more. There are many reasons why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
And here are a few of those reasons directly from Yahweh's word. John 14. This is why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father, we read this out earlier, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither, neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So in verse 16 of this particular passage, it says he's our hot helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper and abides with us. When you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, he's there to help you and abides with you wherever you go. This is probably why David could say that psalm, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because we know he had the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, it says the Holy Spirit is truth. He's the spirit of truth. This is where we get our discernment from. How do we discern it from truth and deception? Well, if you're filled and baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit, he's your helper to help you discern what is truth. And also he's in the last part of that verse 17, it says he dwells with you. So the Holy Spirit dwells within you to help you to be your teacher. A little bit later in the same chapter, chapter 14, verses 26 to 27, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So again, we see in this particular passage, verse 26, he teaches us. The Holy Spirit teaches and reminds us of his word. Verse 27, he gives us peace and shalom. That's where our peace and shalom comes from, the Holy Spirit that's within you. I mean, I, I, many of us have gone through really bad experiences through our life as believers. And you get that peace, you get that shalom, you get that strength because of the Holy Spirit that's in you. He gives you peace and shalom and also he helps you overcome fear. Let, it says here, let not your heart be tra- troubled, neither let it be afraid. The Holy Spirit helps you overcome your fear. Another example is John fifteen twenty six. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. So the Holy Spirit testifies of Yeshua. So if you're listening to something that doesn't testify of Yeshua, that's not the Holy Spirit. It's not truth. It's something else. So the Holy Spirit always testifies of Yeshua. Acts 8, 1, 8. Acts 1, 8. When you shall receive power, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So the Holy Spirit gives you power. When you're in your work situations, when you're dealing with crappy situations and circumstances and people and situations, the Holy Spirit gives you power to be witnesses of Yeshua. When people are talking about Yeshua to other people, that's the Holy Spirit in them, giving them the power to be witnesses. John 16, 7 to 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. So when you do something wrong, and you know you've done something wrong, that's called conviction. 
the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, but he also convicts of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, 13 and 14, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So here we see here the Holy Spirit guides you to all truth. So whatever you listen to, whoever you listen to, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And not only that, he tells us of things to come. It says here, he will tell you of things to come. You will know, you will not know what's to come if you're not immersed or baptized in the Holy Spirit. And not only that, he will also glorify Yeshua. He can only speak what the word says. He can only, because the word is truth. He can only lead and guide and teach what the word says. Why? Because he's God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh's active presence on earth. Just about finished. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. So it says here, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. The Holy Spirit in us manifests the works and gifts of the Spirit. You cannot operate in the gifts of the Spirit if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't. And not only have to operate in the spiritual gifts. Finish on this. With all this said and done, we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to successfully follow Yahweh and his commandments. The Holy Spirit teaches us, guides us, helps us in our discernment, gives us gifts and power, leads us into truth, convicts us when we sin, causes us to change and become more like Yeshua, comforts us, gives us peace and a sound mind, Help us to walk in love. That's a big one. Helps us to walk in love. The Holy Spirit, you can only walk in true love by the Spirit. We need the baptism. We need to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, full stop. There's no question we need to be baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit. And this can happen by the Father just sending his Spirit on you, or it can be done by the laying of an on of hands by those who have the Holy Spirit. As we read over and over, we've read over and over again. So I encourage everyone who hears this message to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Remember, one of the Hebrew words means to be surrounded by the leader of the house. This is how what one of the Hebrew words for Baptism means is to be surrounded by the leader of the house. So if you want to be surrounded by Yahweh, you need to be filled by you need to be immersed by the Holy Spirit. And when you have that, you are surrounded by him. And I just want to finish on this. Another reason why we need this. In ancient Hebrew, betrothals. Betrothals is an old way of saying engagement. Is that right? That's right. Engagement. In ancient Hebrew betrothals, the groom would send gifts to the future bride to encourage her and uplift her while she waited and tarried for the groom to come and take her to the wedding ceremony. The Holy Spirit is the gift along with the gifts of the Spirit to uplift, to edify and encourage his bride until Messiah comes and receives her for the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's just a beautiful, tangible picture of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We can see this in the same way as a Jewish Hebrew wedding. And we know that in the passage where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, it is to edify and encourage the body who is the bride.
until Messiah comes to receive her. And then we know that the wedding supper of the Lamb takes place. So he's given us the Holy Spirit as a gift to edify and to encourage us. He's given us the different gifts of that same Spirit to minister to each other, again, for the edification, for the building up of the bride. So they're they're a gift for us. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that uh, this impacts us. Father, if there's people there and people listening to my voice, if they're not baptised with the Spirit, I pray that you would encourage them to do so. Father, that they would take action and take steps to have the Holy Spirit in their lives. Then they can operate in the gifts. Then they can be led into all truth. Then they can be taught all truth. Father, I just pray that uh, people would really think on these things. Father, if you love your people, you want them to operate in your gifts, you want them to operate in your power, to be witnesses to Yeshua, to be witnesses to you. And Father, I just pray again that you speak to people and that they would take action, that they would understand that they need to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word, and your word is truth. Father, I thank you again for opening our eyes to these things. Help us to get our head around these things. Help us to understand these things, and then not only that, to act upon them. We thank you, Yahweh. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for everything. I thank you for the gifts that edify, that encourage, that that help us. And not only that, Father, I thank you that you surround us in all that we do. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.